the one in charge of you is more aware of your situation and what is good for you than you yourself are. Does not Allah say, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْءً وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ It is possible you dislike something and it is for your own good. And the passage goes on and on, but this is a beautiful passage I felt where Ibn al-Jawzi, he summarized the essence of this thing. Is that do not ask, why does Allah not respond to my dua? No, this is not proper. Rather look at the benefits and wisdoms behind it and thank Allah that He has chosen an option for you that is better than what you yourself desire. But this does not mean that you give up the dua. Because as long as you make the dua, Allah will continually give you. If He doesn't give you that, He will give you other than that. Don't give up the dua. Don't use this as an excuse to give up the dua. Rather you use this to assuage yourself, to comfort yourself. When the delay is, uh, is coming, you use it to comfort yourself. Well, there must be some wisdom behind it. And here are some of the benefits and uh, portions to think about over the delaying the response of the dua. Then we will conclude with one last topic insha'Allah. And if we have time, maybe one more. Dua and its relationship with Qadr. Many, many people ask this. We all know that everything has been written for us. Allah has written everything down and He knows everything that will happen. So they say, why should I make dua? If it's written, it'll happen. And if it's not written, even if I make dua, it will not happen. Lots of people have this concept and idea. Well, let us take the logical consequence of this methodology and ideology. Ask him back, why do you go to work? Because if your salary is written for you, you will get it, even if you go or you don't go. Then ask him, why do you go to the groceries and buy your food? If your food is written, it will fall down from the skies for you and you will eat it. Then ask him, why do you raise the morsel of food to your mouth? If it is written for you, it will jump up into your mouth. You see the logical consequences of this type of ideology. Yes, it is written for you, what will happen? But you do not know. Therefore, you strive your best to obtain it using all the possible means. And dua is one of the most primary possible means of obtaining your goal. Just like the farmer, when he plants his seeds, he does not know it will it grow or not. But he does know if he doesn't plant, it will not grow. If he doesn't plant any harvest, he will not have a crop to harvest. But when he plants the seeds, then he makes dua to Allah. Oh Allah, give it good light, give it good rain, let it grow. So too is dua. It is a means, a path that we must take in order to arrive at the destination. We don't know what is written for us, so we don't take that into account. Whether it is written or not, we don't know. But we have to make dua for it to occur. Also realize that it is possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write something for a person and then put a condition on it. And Allah knows whether that condition will be fulfilled or not. So He will say, for example, if so-and-so makes dua, he will not fall sick. But if he does not make dua, he will fall sick. This too is possible as Qadr. And the angels do not know what will happen. They only read the Qadr. They do not know it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether he will make dua or not. If he makes dua, then that evil will be removed from him. And if he doesn't make dua, he will continue in that evil. So the point is that we do not know what is in our Qadr. Therefore we do not base our actions upon it. We try our best with all means, physical and spiritual. Just like we wake up in the morning and go to work because we want to get our money. Just like we go to the grocery market, we cook, we eat. Just like we get married because we want to have kids. It's not going to happen just like that. Same too with our dua. We use it as a means and a tool. Whether it's written or not, we don't know. We don't have to ponder over it. But one of the ways at arriving at that goal is through the medium of dua. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said that caution will be of no benefit against qadr. No matter how cautious you are, for example, if it's written that you're going to be in an accident, doesn't matter how cautiously you drive, it will happen to you. Because Allah has written for it. So cautious, cautiousness or caution will be of no benefit against qadr. But dua is a benefit to all things, whether they have, whether they have occurred or not. Dua can repel qadr. Like we said, Allah can put a condition if He wishes. If the person makes dua, he will be saved from the accident. And if he doesn't make dua, he will be in the accident. And the angels, when they get the qadr for that day, they do not know. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And based on what the person does, that will happen to him. So we make dua. We say, oh Allah, save us from an evil death. Save my family from, and myself from trials and tribulations. لا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به. Okay, grant us a good life in this world and the hereafter. آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة. What will happen or not, we do not know, but we have to make the dua for it. So it is not proper to ask this question. Is that if it is written for me, why should I make dua? Because the same question can then be 
given back to you. If it is written for you, why do you go to work? If your food is written for you, why do you cook it? If your food is written for you, why do you even raise it to your mouth? Let it be cooked by itself and it will jump out up at you. That will not happen. Like Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, you will have to strive in order to get money because the skies don't rain gold and silver. You're not going to get gold and silver through rain. You're going to have to strive, work hard in order to get money. Same too with dua. It is a tool. It is a, a means, a goal, a path that we use in order to arrive at the destination. And we know that dua changes qadr. We explained this how. The Prophet ﷺ said nothing changes qadr except dua. We explained how this is the case. That it is possible that Allah has written the qadr with a condition. That if we make dua, this will happen. If we don't make dua, it will not happen. Like in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says that... Uh, I'll, re- I'll paraphrase it, it's not over here in front of me. I'll paraphrase it, that dua comes out of the mu'min and fights qadr. Literally fights qadr. And one of the two will be victorious over the other. It is possible something is coming down in qadr, that this will happen to you. But when you make dua to save yourself from this, it is possible that the dua will fight the qadr and overcome it. And Allah knows beforehand what will happen. But to us, we do not ponder over the qadr. We just try our best. And we said that dua is one of the ways of trying to achieve that goal. Before we conclude, there's a few important topics uh, to talk about. Of them is dua and its inherent proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us in contrast to some people who say that Allah is everywhere. Obviously Allah is not everywhere physically. He's everywhere in His knowledge. He is obviously not around us. We are not walking through Allah. The point is dua is one of the ways to prove this. Why? Because we make dua, what do we do? We raise our hands up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We raise our hands up to Allah, showing, and if this is even the non-Muslim, even the kafir. When he makes dua, what does he do? He looks up. Because he, he realizes in his fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above him. The Muslim, the kafir, the child, the, the, the aged person, all of them, it is in their fitrah that when they make a dua, it goes up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is of the ways you can use to prove that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Allah says in the Quran, is ala al or He is above us, uh, above the throne. Uh, another important point or a question was asked about wiping one's face after finishing the dua. We said that there is a few ahadith related about this. Some scholars make it authentic, some scholars make it uh, weak, and whatever one follows, there's evidence for it, because there is evidence for that, to wipe the face over the hands after finishing uh, dua. And also, let us not forget that the most important thing that we have to ask about is our own religion, is steadfastness in our faith, is to increase our guidance. Let us beware of being of those people who ask only for this dunya and they forget about the akhirah. In fact, if you look at the du'as of the Prophet wasallam, you find that the majority, the vast majority of his du'as were about the hereafter, were about forgiveness, were about maghfirah, we're about rahmah. We're about entering Jannah and saving oneself from the fire of hell. We're about being guided. And yet if you look at most of us, the vast majority of our du'as about, are about this dunya. Give me money. Give me family. Give me children. And this is a sign of the weakness of iman. Because it shows you that we're preferring the temporary pleasures of this world over the pleasures of the hereafter. And we also said this is a type of imitation of shaitan. Because shaitan asked Allah one du'a only. And that is for this world. For life. إلى يوم يبعثون. Give me life until the day of judgment. So let us not be like shaitan. Let us remember that we have more important things to ask about than the matters of this world, and that is the matters of the hereafter. So, brothers and sisters, let us think after today's few lectures. Let us ponder over these aspects that we have studied, these verses of the Quran, and these ahadith of the Prophet. Let us see the beauty of this dua. How strong and powerful it is. And let us ask ourselves the status of dua in our daily lives. How often do we turn to Allah? How sincerely do we do so? What are the matters that we ask? And what are the etiquettes that we do when we are performing dua? Do we ask but not care about our own actions and deeds? Do we want Allah to give us and we do not think about our own worship of Allah? What is the status of dua in our daily lives? O Muslim, O you who does not turn to Allah thinking that you are too impious or filthy for Allah to respond to you, are you more filthy than Iblis himself? If Allah can respond to Iblis, 
If Allah can respond to the dua of Iblis, can He not respond to your dua as well? O oh, you who are in distress, don't despair of finding a situation, a way out. وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever has the taqwa of Allah, Allah will find a way out for him. Turn to dua, use it. This is your way out of the distress that you are in. And realize that this situation that you are in is because of your own deeds. So correct your own situation. And correct your own dua, increase the chances of it being responded to. By removing the sins that you are doing. By increasing your own good deeds. So that your communication between yourself and Allah becomes stronger and more direct. Or you who is making dua right now, waiting for a response, don't let shaitan come to you now and tell you to give up. Verily, you will be responded to as long as you meet the conditions of dua. You are doing dua properly, then your dua will be responded to. So don't look at the length and delay of the response. Rather, look at yourself and your own situation. And why is it that the delay is occurring? O you who has had his dua answered and has seen the effects of calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not be like the kafir who, when he prays to Allah and Allah then responds to his prayer, he neglects Allah and forgets all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, this is a cause for you to increase your own ibadah, to come closer to Allah because Allah has responded to your dua and to increase your own iman and taqwa. Verily, dua is your sharpest sword that you can use against every single enemy, hidden or seen in front of you. And it is your strongest weapon. It is your only means of communication between you and your Creator. With this we will conclude insha'Allah. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, shudu wa ilaha tastaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. If there are any questions, if they can be written down quickly insha'Allah and passed to the front. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khair yasir for the whole one day program. I really do appreciate that. Um, I need a favor from you. Yasir doesn't know about it, but I need a favor from you guys. We have an evaluation form which evaluated the, the organizer who organized this program. Also evaluated Yasir how effectively he delay, uh, you know, relayed the message to you guys. So the brother is going to pass in the evaluation form. For the sisters, we're going to drop some evaluation form on, the, on the, that uh, right hand side of the door. I'm sorry. Nicely de- relayed. The, the message. Yeah, that's what I meant. How effective it was, inshallah. So the evaluation form will pass through. Just fill out the evaluation form. Give us some suggestions. What you think about it, and let us know, inshallah. Try to write your questions down, inshallah. Yasser is going to answer the, the inshallah questions. I just wanted to say a few things. Um, second, as you know, I've, I've been repeating a lot of things myself, but I, I have to repeat one more time. Second Saturday of every month, we have program summer in Houston. All the updates, everything you'll get from the website called www.dimasjid.org. Again, www.dimasjid.org. You will find all the updates and uh, things about this website. Second thing is the Texas uh, Annual Convention, Seed Fastness Upon the Religion, which is in the Labor Day weekend, August 31st to September 2nd. I encourage everybody, every brother and sisters to join us in Austin, Texas, inshallah. That's uh, the Labor Day weekend, the last uh, you know, weekend of the August, inshallah. Um, with that, inshallah, I'll let uh, Yasser continue the quick Q&A. And at the same time, if you can just please fill out the uh, evaluation form and give it back to us, I'll really appreciate that. Zakala khair. Remember when you're filling out the evaluation form, Adinun Nasiha, I really do need your Nasiha. Sincerely, I really do benefit from criticisms, believe it or not. I do read them, inshallah. I didn't know about it, but if it's going on, please, what are ways of improving? Because all of us are human beings, we all have mistakes. If there's some way of improving, uh, yani the method or the manner of delivering, then all of us can improve, inshallah. And uh, yani the Prophet, as he said, Al Mu'minu Miratul Mu'min, the believer is like the mirror of his, uh, the believer is the mirror of the other believer, where he can see his mistakes and falsehoods. So please give some constructive criticisms for improvement. So there are many questions here, inshallah, we'll try to respond to as many as possible. This is a very good question. The hadith that says that when one makes, uh, the, or the hadith of Uwais al-Qarni, where Uwais al-Qarni, uh, where the Prophet ﷺ praised him because of his iman and because of his uh, being kind to his parents, what if I advise my parents about the, some things that they do wrong? in their religion. Does this make me unfair or impolite to them? And thus my dua not be accepted? No, this is not the case. If your parents do something that is incorrect, that is not right from Islam, 
then it is obligatory upon you to correct them. But your manner of correcting must be polite and with adab, with etiquette. In fact, it is obligatory if you do not correct them, if you remain quiet, then this is a sin upon you. What we're talking about is fulfilling the rights of the parents, and of those rights is to correct them when they make a mistake. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا If your parents, they are not Muslim, and they try to force you to worship other than Allah, to do shirk with me, then don't obey them. But Allah says, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا In this world, be good companions to them. Even if they're mushrik, pagan, idol worshippers, and they command you to do shirk, don't listen to them. This is not fulfilling their rights because you're disobeying Allah's rights. But even then, be polite and kind to them. Be good to them. Look at the story of Ibrahim and his father. Beautiful story. Where his father was the idol worshipper. And Ibrahim tries gently, sweetly, very nicely. Oh my father, my dear father, ya abati. Oh my dear father, why are you worshipping shaitan? Don't worship shaitan. Oh my dear father, why do you worship that which you carve with your own hands? Oh my dear father, I am scared for you that Allah might punish you because of this beautiful way. He doesn't curse him. Oh you mushrik, you pagan. He keeps on calling out, my dear father, my dear father. And even then he gives him da'wah in a polite manner, in a good way. So too we must be, if our parents are doing something wrong, we should give them advice. Yes, but the way and the manner that we do it in must be with wisdom and politeness. We should never ever, there is no excuse for being rude to our parents in any situation or circumstance. It does not matter what they do. If they even tell you to do shirk, Allah says be good to them. Don't say uff to them. So how about if they don't treat you rightly? How about if they do something that you think they shouldn't do? Never is there a justification for being rude and mean to one's parents. But this doesn't mean like we said that we ignore any faults that they have. Rather it is our obligation to correct them. But it is the way and the matter that we correct them. Uh, that is what is uh, that is what must, what must be seen. Should we face the qila before making dua? Obviously the person who asked this question was not here in the beginning sessions. We said it is part of the etiquette to face qibla when making dua. Should we make dua or can we make dua in a room where there is a photograph on the wall? Uh, really the issue of photography is you know, ikhtilaf but really it's better to avoid it because the Prophet ﷺ said that the angels don't enter a house in which there is a surah. So Yani even if you have photos, I'm not saying you're allowed to have photos, I'm saying even if you do, you don't have to hang them on the wall. You don't have to display them in front of everyone. It is possible that the angels will not come into such a house. And why would you want to live in such a house? Therefore, yani don't display photographs on the walls. Don't display them out. It is possible, like you know when Aisha uh, displayed uh, the picture of a horse and the Prophet and him came, he didn't even enter the house. He said, oh Aisha, there's a picture in the house. Angels cannot come into such a house. Remove it from the, remove it from the, the wall. So he would not even enter the house until the picture was removed. Therefore, uh, I advise you not to have photographs in your house. If you're in someone else's house and there are photographs, obviously that doesn't mean you don't do dua. You, make, you can make dua at all situations and circumstances. Uh, the brother asks about, uh, are we allowed to say the following dua during the hajjud? And he has a long dua. Allahumma lak alhamd. And it is an authentic dua. Yes. اللهم لك الحمد أنت قيم السماوات والأرض ولك الحمد أنت مالك السماوات والأرض ولك الحمد أنت نور السماوات والأرض All of this long dua It is of the sunnah The process of the it In tahajjud uh, Let's try to take topics Related to the question There are a lot of Fiqhi masail We don't want to get into them If there are questions Related to dua We can raise hands Because we don't want to wait For the questions to come Related to dua Surah Al-Asr is Dua Al-Ibadah, not Dua Al-Mas'ala. Uh, and it is narrated that they would say it at the end of the meeting. Yeah. Any more questions related to Dua? Uh, yes, this question was asked last time. I said it's better not to make it a habit. Better not to make it a habit because the Prophet did not make it a habit. Also, you know that after the Salah, there are many dhikrs from the Sunnah. The Prophet would never leave them, never. Of them is Allahu Akbar, Astaghfirullah, 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 Allahumma lakal hamdu, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka ni kundu huna dhalimin, Ashadu wa la ilaha illa Allah wahda wa la sharika la ten times he would say this, okay? And then Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illa Allah, he would say this 31, uh, 31 uh, and 
I mean, uh, 33, 33, and 34 times he would say this. Or sometimes in the 34th time he would say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa alhamdu wa qalabu shayin qadir. All of these du'as are from the Sunnah. The Prophet would never, ever, not do them. Therefore, we should make this a habit. Ayatul Kursi. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever recites Ayatul Kursi after every fard prayer, then nothing prevents him from entering Jannah except his death. So why should we leave up these things? These are sunnahs that we have to do, we should do them. Nothing will prevent a person from entering Jannah except his death if he recites Ayatul Kursi after every salah. Also the Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, when we say this 100 times, then the Prophet ﷺ said that a person will be forgiven even if his sins are like the foam of the ocean. They're like the ocean if you like. His sins will be forgiven after every salah. So we find that those people that make dua after every salah, they leave this sunnah. And they instead do this. They should not leave this sunnah. Do these sunnahs first. Like for example, the Prophet ﷺ said, O Mu'ad, I love you for the sake of Allah. Therefore, never forget to say at the end of the salah, what is the dua who remembers? Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. So the Prophet ﷺ is advising Mu'ad and he tells him, I love you for the sake of Allah. And then he says, never leave this dua. Therefore, why do we leave it? Why do we not say it? These are the things we should make our regular sunnah after dua, after salah. And once in a while, if we want to make dua as well, very often, frequently, no problem. But let us not forget the continual sunnah where these sunnahs that the Prophet ﷺ used to say. Any more questions about dua? Dua how often can we say it? Any time there is an issue which is of concern to you. Any time there is an issue of this world that is of concern to you. Should I do this or not? Should I, even you want to buy a house, should I buy this house or not? You want to buy a car, should I, should I buy this car or not? No problem. Anything that is of concern, of major concern, you're going to be investing significant time, significant money, significant efforts for something, make dua for it, make istikhara for it. For any issue. Many people think istikhara is only made for marriage. This is a mistake. Of course, do it for marriage. But there are millions of things you can make istikhara for. Any significant, we said, not something trivial. You don't pray istikhara, which clothes should I wear today? Nothing should not be trivial. It should be of significance. You're spending considerable effort, time or money in something. So you make istikhara. And the purpose of istikhara is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will choose what is best for you. It is guaranteed. This is the beauty of it. So how can people give up istikhara? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guarantee whatever will happen will be for your good. If you pray the istikhara. Even though you might not see the short term benefit, but for the long term it will be for your good. So this is, can be done at all for anything of major significance. Yes? Yes, a good question of basically how do you know what to do after praying istikhara? Many people think that when you pray istikhara, some divine signal will come to you. You will see a divine green light or a divine red light to go or stop. This is not the case. This is not the case at all. Believe it or not, I have actually read in books that some people have said this. And I've read this, that if, if, if you're supposed to do that thing, you will see something green in the dream. And if you're not supposed to, you'll see something red. So like the stop signs are here. No, this is not the case. This is not the case at all. The purpose of istikhara, realize, is so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guarantee that what is best will occur. You do what you want. You do whatever you incline towards. Suppose you have an istikhara, should I accept this job or not? You ponder over it and you do whatever you want. The istikhara will not necessarily push you in one direction. But if you took the wrong choice of action, the door will close in front of you. Suppose it was for your best that you did not get the job. When you go and, and say to your employer, I want to take the job, he'll say, I'm sorry, it's already full up. For example. So the istikhara will not necessarily push you in one direction or the other. But Allah will open the door for you for that which is better for you. So when you take that path, it will become easier for you to take that path. You will not necessarily see some divine sign of which direction to go. This is a common misconception about istikhara. Anything else? So we'll conclude for the day, inshallah. Tayyib subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. It's not related to dua. Let's stick to dua, inshallah. Afterwards we can do the not related. Inshallah. Yes. A whole long topic, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> the topic of wasila, tawassul, we did not get into it. It is a whole chapter in the book. We did not get into it at all. 
because it's a very long uh, topic. But wasila, there are certain types which are haram, there are certain types which are bid'ah, there are certain types which are shirk, there are certain types which are sunnah and strongly encouraged. Okay, those that are strongly encouraged of them is to make wasila or tawassul with Allah's names and attributes. Ya ghafur ighfirli, ya rahman irhamni, ya razzaq urzukni. This is wasila with Allah's names and attributes. Of them is wasila with your own good deeds. Your own good deeds. You say, Oh Allah, I did such and such a thing. You, do, you, you mention something that you have done which is of significance to you. For example, I gave so much money on one occasion when I knew, and you knew that I needed that money, but I gave it for your sake. If you knew that I did this for your sake, then grant me this. This is wasila that is allowed. Okay? These are wasilas that are allowed. Other type of permissible wasila is to go to a living person in front of you and say, Oh, so and so, make dua for me. As long as you make dua yourself as well. It is allowed to go to some person and say, Make dua for me, even though it is better not to, but it is allowed. This is an w- acceptable wasila. Of the types of wasila is you mentioned the effects of the dua. You say, Oh Allah, give me good health so that I can, for example, you know, go for jihad or do this or that. You, do, you mention something as a result of that good. Okay? Give me strong memory so that I can memorize the Quran. Okay, you mentioned the effects of that good, this is a wasila. All of these wasilas are very strongly encouraged and permissible. The types of wasilas which are shirk are to call out to other than Allah. You call out to Ramakrishna or with the you know, help of Ramakrishna, obviously this is shirk and kufr. Of the types of wasila which is an innovation, bid'ah, is the example that you gave to use the name of a pious saint or a prophet or an angel. O oh Allah, because of your love of Jibreel, grant me this. O oh Allah, due to the status of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, give me this. This is an innovation. And it is a stepping stone to shirk. It is not shirk in and of itself. It is a stepping stone to shirk. Therefore, it should be uh, avoided as completely. Because the Prophet Sallallahu did not practice it. And none of the Sahaba practiced it as well. To ask by the wasila or the jah or the status of saints and of the Prophets and of the malaika this is an innovation which leads to shirk and uh, polytheism. Therefore, it should be avoided. Even though many of you know this is very common in our culture and custom. And some people even try to bring evidences uh, for it. But if you read and research, and inshallah this book has some content, you know, more research on this as well, in front of you. And there's another book as well called Tawassul. It's types and its rulings in Islam. It is a whole book just about wasila. Available in English, written by Shaykh al-Albani. A whole entire book where you can look at all the evidences for each type of wasila that is allowed, that is prohibited, that is shirk, that is bid'ah. But basically the common type of wasila that, oh Allah, I ask you by the status of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by the jah and by this by the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa All of these, these are not narrated by the Quran and Sunnah. Therefore we should avoid them. So we should stick to the wasila that is found in the Quran and Sunnah. All of a sudden we're getting all of these questions where we're supposed to have finished. Uh, this question is already responded to. Uh, this is fiqhi question. Could you please recommend a good book concerning uh, istikhara? There is a book, uh, The Three Abandoned Prayers. The Three Abandoned Prayers uh, by Adnan Aurur. And it is, a, I don't know the publishing company, but it's some co- company in England. And one of these prayers he talks about is Salat al-Istikhara. This is a very detailed book. You will not find anything more detailed than this on Istikhara in Arabic or in English. He has gone into great detail about Istikhara. This is the three abandoned prayers by Adnan Aur'ur. Uh, it should be available by, uh, if you look at Huda magazine or Jum magazine. Or these magazines, you look at them, some of them will advertise it. Uh, I don't remember the publishing company's name. Inshallah, with that we will conclude. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, wa illa illa